Hello. It's very good to see you again. Welcome to our festive whiskey tasting session. For this whiskey tasting session, we will be celebrating the whiskies of the world. We welcome you today to try various whiskies from Ireland, Scotland, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Canada. Are you familiar with each of those spirit regions? Okay, well, I'll be very happy to let you know a little bit about each of those distillation processes from each of those regions. So today we will be trying Crown Royal Black, which is one of Canada's most famous whiskey brands. We'll be trying Makers from Kentucky, which is a bourbon. We'll be trying Gentleman Jack, which is Jack Daniel's second most famous Tennessee whiskey. We'll be trying Tullamore Dew, which is an Irish whiskey. And lastly, we'll be trying the Smoky Black, which is from Famous Grouse, which is a Scotch. So today I invite you to try each of the whiskies alongside me, as I tell you a little bit about each of them. So because we're celebrating the whiskies of the world, I figured I would start with just a couple of facts about the spelling differences between whiskey, W-H-I-S-K-Y, and W-H-I-S-K-E-Y. So it all dates back to 1878. There was a book called Truths About Whiskey that pointed out the E was added to distinguish Irish from Scotch whiskey. A very long time ago, Scotch whiskey passed itself as Irish whiskey, and at the time, Irish whiskey was considered the top tier whiskey of the world, and it was considered the most prestigious and the most expensive. So, Irish whiskey stepped in and put the E in the word to distinguish itself from Scotch, to show the authenticity of the original product versus Scotch. Some distillers back in Dublin will tell you that the E in Irish whiskey stands for excellence. I quite like that. So today we're going to begin by talking a little bit about Tullamore Dew. Now, I'm aware that you've experienced Irish whiskey at at least one tasting of ours in the past, and that was the Jameson Standard and the Jameson Black Barrel. But I would love today to introduce you to Tullamore Dew. So, let's learn a little bit more about Tullamore Dew. So before we begin trying the first spirit today, I'd like to let you know a little bit about some of the Irish laws and rules regarding Irish whiskey. So firstly, it must be made from a mash of malted barley. It must also be mashed, fermented, and distilled to no more than 94.8% ABV. And it must be matured in wooden casks, such as oak. The barrels must not also exceed 700 litres, and it must be aged for a minimum of three years in Northern Ireland or the Republic of Ireland. It must not contain additives other than water and one specific caramel colouring, and it must retain the characteristics in its raw materials, in other words, the smell and taste must be like whiskey, and it must be bottled at no less than 40% ABV. Those are the basic rules for Irish whiskey. So let's learn a little bit more about specifically Tullamore Dew. Tullamore Dew is an 80 proof blend of triple distilled pot still and malt grain whiskey. It is matured in ex bourbon and sherry casks. The aging on this one has no specific age, which is quite typical for scotches and whiskies, but we know for sure that this is at least three years. So this distillery was founded in 1829 in the town of Tullamore in Ireland by Michael Malloy. The second part of the name Dew or D-E-W are actually the initials of a great Irish writer who also worked at the Tullamore distillery. His name was Daniel Edmund Williams, D-E-W. 
He began his career at the distillery at the age of 15 and became the head of the distillery at 25. During the prohibition in Ireland, the distillery unfortunately had to close. And after the prohibition had ended, instead of opening back up, Tullamore Dew, the drink, moved to County Cork, as well as alongside a few other Irish distillers. Tullamore Dew actually only just moved back to the Tullamore Distillery in 2014. They have just finished the production process for Tullamore Dews for Phase 1, and they are now moving on to Phase 2, which is including grain whiskies into the Tullamore Dew spirit in the Tullamore Dew Distillery. So currently the drink is basically split between the Tullamore Dew Distillery and its original distillery in County Cork. So this is a triple blend whiskey made up of pot still, malt, and grain whiskey. Pot still is a mixture of malted and unmalted barley. That's where you'll get the spice and pepper in this one. But because it was also aged in sherry casks, it does have a slight layer of sweetness to it. Let's give this one a try. There's an immediate hit of fruitiness with this one, but the scent is also passing straight through to the palate, and that fruitiness of oranges and apples that you can perhaps taste seems to be complemented with the spice and pepper. I think this one is absolutely excellent. There seems to be a medium length finish with this one, not overtly complex, and because of that triple distillation, which is classic, but not a rule of Irish whiskies, it goes down perfectly and smoothly. This is entirely distinguishable from the classic Jameson, and a wonderful spirit to add to your Irish whiskey collection. The pepper and spice, as well as some of those almost sweet and dry fruit combinations, linger throughout the finish of this one. What do you think of this one? Mm -hmm. There's certainly a constant presence of the spirit still on the tongue, but it doesn't tend to linger in either warmth or taste on the throat. You like this one? Excellent. Very good. So now, we're going to be moving on to a very classic Scotch whisky. So, in a previous whisky tasting, you have tried the 12-year Glenlivet, and now we're going to be trying the Blender's Edition Smoky Black by Famous Grouse. So before we begin trying the Famous Grouse spirit today, I'll let you know a little bit more information about Scotch whisky's rules and regulations, as well as some information regarding the company. So, Scotch whisky must be aged for a minimum of three years in oak casks, and it must be made entirely from 100% barley, and it must be made entirely within Scotland. So, Irish whisky uses a combination of unmalted and malted barley for a smoother, almost vanilla taste to their whiskies, whereas in Scotland they'll use 100% malted barley for a heavier, deeper, almost richer taste. So you'll notice the taste difference even from using one different technique from the barley in the spirit. So let's have a look at this one now. So this is an 80 proof scotch with no specific aging. All I can tell you about this one is that it is, of course, a minimum of three years. The notes on this one, there's a lot of fruitiness. Now, instinctually, you might pick up on all of that peatiness that is very typical from a scotch. But delving deeper into the scent of this one, it's a broody scent. It's very smoky, musky, but just beneath those layers. There are some dry fruits to this one. They're light, but they do linger throughout. So, Famous Grouse is also the highest selling whiskey 
in Scotland and it has been since the year 1980, so it's very popular. Its competitors include Bells and Teachers because they're around the same price point. It's also distilled in Glen Turret Distillery, which is actually the oldest distillery in Scotland, which dates back to the early 18th century. A lot of peaty smoke on this one. And that's a think about as complex as this one is. There is a certain richness to the smoke on this one. There's a slight dabble of the oak from this one. But very rich, very mature. So, let's give this one a go. Wafts of peaty smoke immediately from this one. Yes, this one is very unique and very distinguishable. Some whiskies taste similar. This whiskey tastes entirely unique. This is reminiscent of sitting right in front of a cosy fireplace. This is a very comforting, almost winter style drink, as one will make you feel nice and warm inside. Try another sip of this one. When you chew on this one a little bit more, and bear it into your teeth, this caramel, this spice, it's excellently smooth when it goes down. The smoke on this one complements that very gentle sweetness. The palate of this one is very close and similar to the scent of this one. Very similar, passes almost identically through. Smoke on the scent, smoke on the taste. Gentle layers of fruit. Not particularly complex, but rich, robust, very strengthening, very a, a strong spirit. In the finish on this one, it's long, peaty, much hotter and warmer in the throat, and it just completely surrounds the taste buds, and it just bears into all of your teeth. It's almost unnecessary to chew on this one, but absolutely astounding and wonderful, not only for the price point, but just for those flavours alone. This is a really, really hearty scotch. What did you think of this one? Mmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is certainly not a newcomer's whiskey, in my opinion, but definitely one for those who have a little bit more of a mature palate for those who definitely tried a few whiskies prior to this one. Yes, I find that if you jump into a whiskey like this one, whilst it's slightly on the lower proof side, it does have layers that require a mature tongue, and for that you will need to try various more gentle whiskies first to get to those fruity notes on that one. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to be moving on to Canadian whiskey. So, with the Crown Royal Black, there are a few rules and regulations to create Canadian whiskey. So, just like Irish, Scotch, Tennessee, and Kentucky drinks, this must be fermented, distilled, and aged in Canada for no less than three years in barrels that hold no larger than 700 litres. This must be also, again, at least 80 proof, however, there are no restrictions to what is involved in making their whiskies. Most Canadians will refer to the Canadian whisky as rye, so if you order a rye, you'll probably be requesting a Canadian whisky, which can be a little bit confusing at times because Canadian whiskies aren't necessarily high rye whiskies, but they're still called rye whiskies. It does tend to use rye in the drinks, rarely barley. So that might be a consideration as to why it's focused a little bit more on called a rye whiskey. This is Crown Royal Black, which is a little bit more of a newer addition to the Crown Royal range. The original Crown Royal came out in 1939, whereas this one came, back, came out in 2010. So definitely a newer drink in their range. 
So Canadian whiskey was extremely popular back in the 1950s and 60s, particularly a company called Canadian Club. You will have noticed if you've seen Mad Men that that bottle is used a lot in that show. The reason for that is after the prohibition was over in America, American distillers were still trying to get back on their feet and people had become more accustomed to Canadian whiskey. So for a short while, it was one of the most popular whiskies in America, or at least up to the 60s. Mm -hmm. So there is a difference between Kentucky bourbons and Canadian whiskey. The two most distinguishable differences between a Canadian whiskey and a Kentucky bourbon is in the barrels and the combination of the grains. In American whiskies or bourbons, they mash all of the grains together all at the same time, whereas Canadian whiskies will mash them all separately and then combine them. Also, with barrels, Kentucky bourbon must use new American oak barrels, whereas a Canadian whiskey can choose to use new or old oak barrels. So, Crown Royal, as well as all Canadian whiskies, can be quite flexible. Okay, so now let's move on to trying this one. and We'll explore a little bit more about the company, as well as the notes of this one. Okay. So, Crown Royal Black is a bourbon-style Canadian whiskey. Still a rye, still a whiskey, but bourbon-style. Or some have said at least. Crown Royal Black is aged in heavy charred barrels for a little bit more of a smoky flavour. The notes of this one are a little oaky, vanilla, hefty amount of cinnamon, and ginger. What do you think? Yes, there are some really interesting spices in this one. The colour of this one is almost amber, I would say a beautiful deep amber. This is a deeper, richer follow-up to the original Crown Royal. It has a slight more thickness to it. Crown Royal, by the way, is distilled and produced in Gimli, Manitoba in Canada, and 80% of the grains used are from the local area. Mm -hmm. There's some, also some light maple notes on this one. Almost dry fruit scents to this one. Peaches, apricots, very sweet, but very lovely, very interesting. There's something that is almost a bourbon-esque style. Canadian rye, does have a beautiful blend to it that makes it truly unique to itself. Crown Royal famously also uses five different mash bills and 12 different cut distillation columns to make up its signature recipe. Yes, it's quite a wonderful experience to try Crown Royal. Okay, so let's give this one a taste. I'm quite excited to try this one with you. Slightly more of a thin spirit. Um, it seems to begin with layers of fruity but dry rye. So it's true to the name on that one. has an almost velvety texture and those scents that are very similar with Kentucky bourbons just completely melt right into the palate on this one. That charring from the barrel on that one. It's excellent. Brown sugar just seems to be just completely littered throughout it. But to really get a good bite on that brown sugar you do need to let it settle for a little bit. It's almost in the finish of this one. The finish is simple, not complex at all. 
midst a very smooth, gentle drink. As I let it sit on my tongue and in my throat for a while, there's some cedar and ginger, f ginger finish with this one. It's vanilla from beginning right to the end on this one. It wasn't picked up necessarily as a note from the nose, but it's definitely been passing through the palette on this one. Mm. It has a light but long finish, which I think is a wonderful way of finishing a whiskey. Some could be quite harsh and brutal. Some can finish just as strongly as they began, leaving so much heat in the throat. This one has run down smooth. Mm -hmm. Despite there being less of emphasis on the distillation process of this one, it goes down excellently smooth. Mm -hmm. Do you like this one? Mm. Perfectly balanced to get that cedar and rye, oak, vanilla, just layered throughout with those fruity dry, fr fruity dry ryes. It's quite good. Hmm. Good. I'm glad you like this one. It's a very interesting version of a Canadian whiskey. Now we're moving on to a Tennessee whiskey. So, this Tennessee whiskey that I'm showing you today is Gentleman Jack, which was the second major entry into the Jack Daniels range in the 80s, so it's been around a little while. Tennessee whiskies are pretty much exactly the same as Kentucky bourbons, however, they do have one distinct feature to the creation of Tennessee whiskies, and that is the process of charcoal filtration. I'll let you know a little bit more about that in just a moment. So, Jack Daniels does follow all of the legal requirements to be considered a bourbon. It would just be considered a Tennessee bourbon. However, they like to call themselves purely a Tennessee whiskey. So, bourbons, Tennessee whiskies, they're a little bit more open with the information regarding the aging and the mash bills and creations of those drinks. So, I can certainly tell you a little bit more about a good Kentucky bourbon or a Tennessee whiskey. So the mash bill of this one is 80% corn, 12% barley, and 8% rye. Very, very high on the corn scale of this one. Of all of the drinks you've tried so far at our whiskey tastings, I think this one might perhaps be the highest corn mash bill of all the whiskies you've currently tried. Mm -hmm. So this will be interesting to try. So Jack Daniels drink, the traditional old number seven, is honestly exactly the same as Gentleman Jack. The only difference between Gentleman Jack and the traditional Jack Daniels is that this goes through a double charcoal filtration, whereas Jack Daniels goes through one, and that is after the distillation process. This one goes through the second one after it's finished being aged right before being bottled. So the process required to create a Tennessee whiskey is identical to creating a Kentucky bourbon. However, the one unique process is the Lincoln County process. So I will quote Jack Daniels exactly on how they can use their charcoal filtration for their spirits. After the spirit is distilled, they use the Lincoln County process. The whiskey is then filtered through sugar maple charcoal. Jack Daniels allows its whiskey to drip for six days in 10 foot vats, passing through charcoal that was made by burning maple wood that had been infused with 100 proof Jack Daniels whiskey before being put in new charred oak barrels and aged for an estimated four to seven years. So that's the approximate aging that we have on this one. So, the Jack Daniels Distillery is the oldest distillery in the United States, dating back to 1866. So, let's try this one now. The colour is beautiful, light, elegant amber on this one. Just, just beautiful. There is, despite there being just one more 
little feature to this one with the extra charcoal filtration. A tremendous difference between the original Jack Daniels flavour and the Gentleman Jack. You may find that if you perhaps don't like Jack Daniels traditional old number no. 7, you may embrace this one a little bit more. Let's give this one a go. So the nose on this one, sweet notes of cherry, pink peppercorn, orange peel, vanilla, just so many beautiful notes flowing through this one. The only predominant scent on this one is warmth, everything else perfectly balanced, gentle, e easy, cosy, and even. That pink peppercorn almost slightly tingles your nose. Could be the orange peel. Just a wonderful fusion of scents on this one. And as I take a deeper inhale of this one, it's not overbearing, but there are so many hidden layers under this one. But that base layer and beginning layer all begin and end with vanilla. And it's tied together with those beautiful notes of cherry. This is, this is absolutely lovely on the scent. What do you think on this one? Hmm. Yes, I agree. Let's try this one now. I invite you to try it along with me. Medium body. Not as thin as the Crown Royal Black. Not as thick as some other spirits. It is certainly a tasty, lovely spirit on this one. Sugar cane, black pepper, and nice. Smoother than the original number seven Jack Daniels. Goes down much easier. All very distinguishable, but light flavors on this one. Some people find that with smoother whiskies, such as the Gentleman Jack, or most Irish whiskies, you lose a lot of the more complex flavours. So it depends on what, more what you want out of a whisky. If you want balanced flavours that aren't particularly overpowering each other, but they go down nice and smoothly and just have the most perfect finish on the throat, an Irish whisky or more of an emphasised distillation um, might be best for you. It all depends on the consumer. There's a short to mid-length finish on this one. It's fairly abrupt. It's pretty typical with a more distilled drink. Clove, cinnamon, somewhere lingering there. Very gently so. In the last whiskey tasting that you joined us for back in October, uh, you tried Knob Creek, and I think that this is very similar to that. They both used peppercorn throughout the flavouring of that one. Mm hmm You agree? Yes, yes. This is certainly... Excellent drink, it goes down lovely and smooth, and overall, very agreeable drink. Good, good. So now we're going to be moving on to the last spirit for this whiskey tasting session today, and that is Maker's Mark. Alright. So, we have visited Scotland, Ireland, Canada, Tennessee, and now we're back to Kentucky. So this is a small batch weighted bourbon whiskey made in batches of less than 1,000 gallons, around 19 barrels at a time. This has a mash bill of 70% corn, 16% red winter wheat, and 13% barley. So you may have noticed I mentioned red winter wheat. Some other spirit companies may use this, I'm only familiar with makers using this very specific type of wheat. 
So I think this one is actually worth taking a closer look at because this is very easily one of the most beautiful bottles in the world for spirits. Whiskies, bourbons, spirits in general. So as you can see, this has the trademarked wax seal that melts down it and no two wax seals are the same. You have a look at this one. The details of this one are just beautiful. The way the wax just drips down here. It leaves for a very personal feel with this one. Every bottle you buy is going to have its own individual little story to it. And I really love that about this one. The colour on this one is toffee. Very pretty. As you can see here and inside your glass. Beautiful. The elegant bottle throughout the drink is a divine colour. And as you perhaps may notice in a moment, it, I tend to think it has a gorgeous scent and taste and lingering flavour. So I wanted to show you the bottle a little bit closer on this one because this is worth having a peek at. So Maker's Mark uses a few different flavour combinations for their spirits. They have Maker's Mark, which is this one, uh, Maker's 46, Cask Strength, they have quite a few different flavours, but that is only semi-new to the company because the creator, I believe his name was Bill Samuels, um, felt quite passionate about sticking to one flavour combination. And so the company for several decades stuck to that exact flavour combination and didn't quite branch out with other styles until semi-recently. Makers is actually one of the few companies that actually rotates its barrels for consistent ageing, so they'll move the barrels from the top to the bottom, bottom to the top. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually going to read to you what it says on the side of the bottom of this one as a quote from the grandson of the founders of Maker's Mark. This whiskey, by the way, is also 90 proof, making it the strongest whiskey out of the collection of spirits today. Mm -hmm. Maker's Mark, America's handmade bourbon whiskey, all started because my grandfather, Bill Samuel Sr., a sixth-generation Kentucky distiller, didn't care for the whiskey his family made. So in 1953, he burned the family recipe, literally, and started over. His taste vision was a soft, rich, creamy, full-bodied yet balanced bourbon. Meanwhile, my grandmother Margie was busy designing the bottle you're holding. In fact, it was her idea to hand dip every bottle in red wax. To this day, making Maker's Mark in small quantities, a little at a time, is still a family affair. Enjoy. And that is from the grandson of the founders. This is a very lovely bottle, beautiful as a gift, but also just an excellent whiskey for yourself. And there's so much decoration and personality in these bottles, especially even with the texture on the front here. There is a texture to this one. It comes at an excellent price. Um, the typical Maker's Mark will retail at under $30. Yeah, a very fair price, at least for the size of this bottle. Mm -hmm. So I invite you to try the last whiskey for this tasting today. Almost obnoxiously sweet on this one. Mm -hmm. Strong, beautiful fusion of caramel, vanilla, brown sugar. Quite traditional for a few of the whiskies you've tasted and smelt thus far. There's almost perhaps even notes of strawberry in this one. Mm -hmm. I think that might be as complex as the scent is on this one. So let's give this one a go. So just as I remember, um, the scent is completely different and unique to the taste of this one. The taste is certainly not as deep on the palate as it is on the nose. There is heavy oak caramel, cinnamon, very light layers of the sweetness lingering from the scent on this one, heavily predominant on that heavy oak. Mm. 
not so much charring or smokiness at all, but that woody flavour and texture just starts from beginning to end on this one and it mellows out right at the end. Wonderful finish to the drink on this one. Mm -hmm. At the end, when it lingers on the tongue and down the throat, and as you chew on it through your, with your teeth, it's almost a buttered rum flavour to this one. And that sweetness had to come through at some point from the scent. Hints of tobacco, leather, very fascinating, complex spirit, which certainly is a little bit more typical for whiskies or bourbons that exceed 80 proof. Mm. With a medium length finish on this one. But the balance of this one isn't as even as some of the other whiskies. And that is expected when the whiskies get higher in proof, get a little bit more complex, more flavours are emphasised and focused on. You'll find sometimes that when a whisky is 80 proof, or around 80 proof, the flavours don't tend to be as complex. Which is why something like an Irish whiskey is pretty perfect. You don't want too many flavours going on, you want a smooth, clean finish. And that's why I tend to have a soft spot for Irish whiskey. Mm -hmm. But if you want a little bit more of an adventure with your whiskey, higher proof whiskies such as bourbons, which love to use a combination of ingredients, are exactly fitted to that. They are wonderful, um, especially as an interpretation piece from one person to another. Whilst everyone will agree that this is quite an oaky whiskey, with sweetness on the scent, your palate will take this a little bit different to mine. And that's why I adore bourbons, and I believe that everybody should have a combination of most whiskies, whether it be Irish, Scotch, bourbon, whatever your preferences might be. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give this another sip. Because the taste on this one is certainly isn't as powerful, not quite obnoxious, but powerful as the scent. Every sip is almost a different story. So it's quite fascinating in that regard. But overall, tobacco, leather, lovely busted rum, which is such a wonderful farewell from something like vanilla. I have no distaste or dislike for vanilla. But it, be, it can be quite lovely to try something a little bit different to vanilla in those underlayers of the drink. So buttered rum is a very, very welcomed ingredient into that. Or at least flavour for me. Mm-hmm. Good, you like that one. Well, thank you so much for visiting us today for this celebration of the whiskies of the world. We really hope that you enjoyed yourself, and we hope that you learned a few things along the way. And we thank you for visiting us today. Which whiskies did you end up enjoying today, if any at all? That's good. Well, I'm very happy that you got to try a range of whiskies at least. It lets you know which ones you might prefer. So before you go today, we just like to let you know that in a couple months we'll actually be having a strictly bourbon tasting session. So if you'd like to join us for that, we'll email you a little bit in the future with a closer date. We'd be happy for you to join us for that. Of course, well, we look forward to seeing you for that. Thank you for visiting us today and joining us for this wonderful whiskey tasting session. Take care. Goodbye.